Well, grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father, Lord, and Savior Jesus Christ this morning as we celebrate our first Sunday of stewardship today. Our text for this morning's message is from the Gospel reading. Please join me in a word of prayer. Father, we ask, O oh Lord, that we may always find our true source of joy and be connected to the true vine, Jesus Christ. There are so many distractions in our world, O oh Lord, that we have sometimes we pull ourselves off that vine and try to be connected to something else that seems to give us more worldly pleasure and excitement as many times our sinful nature just kind of gets bored hanging with Jesus. We ask, O oh Lord, that through the power of your spirit and means of grace, you would help us always to see there's no better life, no better vine than Jesus Christ, our Lord. In his name we pray. Amen. 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 Well, friends in Christ, today we begin our first Sunday of stewardship. And our theme throughout these next three Sundays is trying to figure out how stewardship and joy uh, belong together. And when we want to talk about joy, I guess the first thing we have to ask ourselves is, what's the definition of joy? Years ago in confirmation instruction, my father tried to tell us what the definition of love was. He first asked the question to us students, eighth graders, we didn't really know what's love, and a number of responses came out of my class, but nothing really sufficient for my father, so he finally just said, Sometimes when you want to talk about emotions, the best way to describe an emotion is to describe the opposite, that love is the opposite of hate. So if that's true, how do you look at joy? Is joy simply the opposite of sadness? Is there more things to this word joy than a simple emotion? If it was all about emotion, how difficult would it be for us as Christian believers to follow the exhortation of St. Paul in Romans chapter, in Philippians chapter 4, verse 4, Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. If joy is always an emotion, are you joyful 24-7, 365 days a year? There's got to be something more to this concept of joy that scripture and Jesus wants us to know. This text in which I am sharing with you this morning is taking place during a time of anxiety and fear. <clears throat> Jesus is talking about joy when he's also telling the disciples he's about ready to leave them, abandon them, and that they will be scattered really like sheep among the wolves in just a few more hours. And so Jesus is telling all these omens that are going to be happening soon. And if you were a disciple in that room, wouldn't you try to be scared a little bit? Wouldn't you be experiencing fear and anxiety? And lo and behold, what the last thing you want to hear about is joy. And that's what Jesus wants to talk about, joy. So he goes into this parable about finding joy and being connected to him who is the true vine. And as he continues to go into this parable or narrative, he begins to explain things which also might give the disciples a little bit more concern. Because you know how it is, we as human beings seemingly focus on the bad news, not the good news. And there were some good things Jesus says in John chapter 15, but there was some stuff that was challenging. Like, uh, number one, he said, you know, any fruit that bears fruit from the vine will be pruned. Now, I don't know about you, but if I was a branch, pruning doesn't sound very comforting. <laughs> Sounds painful, doesn't it? Yeah. So Jesus is telling me that pruning is going to take place in my life. That doesn't sound great. And then he kind of tells me that if I don't bear any fruit... That any branch that doesn't bear fruit is going to be cut off and thrown into the fire. And now I'm really concerned that I might be one of those branches. And you want to talk about joy? But there was no better time in this time of darkness and fear and anxiety to talk about joy than then. Jesus is trying to help these individuals, and you and me, 
know what the true source of joy is all about. A chapter later, Jesus tells those scared, fearful disciples that you will have trouble in this world, no question, John 16, verse 33, <clears throat> but do not fear, I have overcome the world. There is an idea of what joy is about. Joy is having confidence that in the end, God's plan will win. Good will conquer evil. Jesus began that victorious march on the day of his resurrection after offering himself as a sacrifice for our sins, reconciling us to God, walks out of the tomb and proclaims victory over death, sin, and the devil. But the victory is not yet fully accomplished until that last day, which we were going to celebrate next Sunday, Christ the King Sunday, where we as Christian believers confess that in the end, <coughs> good conquers evil, especially in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And so despite what's taking place in our world, no matter how much darkness we are surrounded by, or troubles we are experiencing, there can be this little sense of joy and confidence that we will win. Because we are connected with Jesus. And this thing about pruning, painful though it may be, yet there can be joy found in the idea that when God is pruning us in our life, He's got a plan and a purpose for it. According to the plan and purpose of a vineyard dresser, why do they prune? So that the branch can be more fruitful. And over the years of my ministry, I don't know how many people have come in and talked to me about, Pastor Rabel, I don't know if I'm being pruned or if I'm being punished. It's sometimes a tough thing to discern, isn't it? Am I being punished or am I being pruned. When we look at things in our life, sometimes it's just not that we are being punished for some sins. It's just that God is sometimes pruning us to make us more fruitful. And we can find a sense of joy again, not necessarily this emotional joy, but this fact of confidence that God's got a plan and we can rest in peace knowing that despite all pruning taking place in our life, he's making us more bountiful. He's making us better. And then another statement of joy that he brings in this pericope today, this narrative, is that joy is found in being connected with Christ. He says he's the vine, we are the branches, and that's how your joy is full. And how do we get connected with Jesus? We get connected when we come to faith in his name, whether it be through the words of God and the scriptures or through our baptism, we are connected with Christ. And that connection is eternal. It goes beyond the grave. St. Paul talks about this connection in Romans chapter 6, which takes place in our baptism. He shares, do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus, have been baptized into his death. There is connection. We're not only connected with his death, but we're also connected with his burial. Therefore, we've been buried with him through baptism into death. So that as Christ was raised from the dead, through the glory of the Father, we too might walk a new life. And if we are connected with Christ in his death and burial, St. Paul says we're connected with Christ in his resurrection. If we have died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with Christ. This is a bond that cannot be separated. St. Paul says the same thing in Romans chapter 8. Nothing can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. Nothing. It's an eternal bond. Not even death. Not even any angels or powers or principalities. No swords. Nothing can separate us from this blessed joyful connection with Jesus Christ. But I think sometimes we as Christian believers are challenged about our sense of joy 
being first with Jesus. And I think one of the seasons and holidays that we struggle with as Christians, that this becomes more focused, is in Christmas. A number of people have shared with me, Pastor, I'm not going to celebrate Christmas this year. I'm not putting a tree up. I'm not buying presents. I'm not playing any Christmas music in my house. And you know what's happened in that person's life? They've lost a spouse. They've lost a loved one. Christmas is not going to be the same. Well, I know I haven't lost a spouse, but I've lost parents. And I remember the last Christmas I had with my mother. Dad had died two years earlier, and my mom was sick with cancer. Little did we know in 2010 that that would be our last Christmas with her. And she asked everybody in the family, no matter where they were in the country, to gather around the tree that year. All of us were involved in church work, so it's very hard for us to leave our ministries and head to our mother's house in Minnesota. But my sister is a DCE. She made it up there. I, as a pastor in Indiana, made it there. My two brothers, they were all there. She had around the tree presents that year of my father's belongings, of things that she thought would be important for her children and grandchildren to have in possession for my dad, who had died two years earlier. It was a meaningful Christmas. It was kind of a sad Christmas, but then Two months later, my mom dies. We didn't know that was going to happen. But we've not really worried about gathering around the tree without my mom and dad around anymore. Because I find my joy, not necessarily in family unity, my primary joy is found in unity with Jesus. And so when I gather around the Christmas tree these years after my parents' death, I celebrate the fact that this bond with the vine is eternal. That we worship a God that is not a God of the dead, but of the living. We worship in the idea that my father and mother are still alive with God in his presence, celebrating the joy in the presence of God. Oh, yes, I celebrate Christmas with joy because of the eternal connection my mom and dad have experienced by the grace of God. I don't mourn or grieve the fact they're no longer here. I celebrate the fact that they're celebrating Christmas in the best place known to man. The eternal connection with Christ enables us to deal with our griefs and comforts us in knowing when our loved ones are gone, they are in the presence of a God who is the God of the living not of the dead. That connection with the vine helps me celebrate things when life is lost around me. Joy. It's just having confidence in God, God's promises, and joy finding value and appreciating the nutrition God offers to you and me through his word and sacrament. You're here today because you're about ready to eat of the table that God has placed before you in your wilderness, whatever that may be. You're here today because you are not like those people who were in the wilderness some years ago after eating manna for 40 years, finally got angry with Moses and said, we loathe this miserable food. And you know what happens when you loathe the food God puts before you? You get bitten by snakes. You fall away. Today, God puts a table before you, a table where the vine serves to feed the branches through word and sacrament so you may produce bountiful fruits for him and find joy in doing so. Martin Luther, when he tried to explain the meaning of the third commandment, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy, is asked the question, how do we despise preaching in God's word? How do we loathe preaching in God's word? He gave three answers. Number one, when we don't attend church faithfully. Number two, when we don't use the word and sacraments of God at all. And number three, when we use the word and sacrament carelessly. 
when we show loathing toward the table God has provided for us. I'm thankful that you're here this morning. I'm thankful that you are looking to be fed and nourished and find joy in the table God has prepared for you. And this is what joy is all about. Being happy that you're with Jesus now and forever. Being happy and content with the food God offers you through his son in the word and sacrament. And being happy with the fruit that God produces through you, whether you get pruned or not. But joyfully celebrating the fact there are buds coming from your branches. And it doesn't matter if it's a hundredfold or just tenfold. It just matters that you're alive in the vine. That's what is important. And when we understand joy in this way, I think it becomes very easy to follow the exhortation of St. Paul, rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. In his name, amen.